Hello and welcome to another edition of Remy's Rave of the Day. I am your host, Remy, or better known as Remington Afri, the youth minister at the Meadows Church of Christ right here in Beaumont in the great state of Texas. This is a Tuesday edition, episode number 55. We're not really raving about a word or a phrase today. We are raving about a message, a special message in which was delivered this past Sunday in our adult Bible class at the Meadows Church of Christ. We were studying a very cool subject a very interesting subject to some of y'all, I'm sure, and the subject was the resurrection of the dead, and one of the most famous chapters that talks about the resurrection of the dead is 1 Corinthians 15. I just want to be able to highlight some things, share some things with you that was talked about in that class, again, this past Sunday morning at the Meadows Church of Christ, and I want you to be able to grow from it, to learn from it, and to be able to study more on your own after this discussion. So if you have your Bibles, let's grab it, and let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, Looking at the subject, exploring the topic, the resurrection of the dead. It is amazing what Paul is doing with this topic. If you remember in Galatians chapter 1, Paul not being prideful about it, but letting the those audience, those listeners know in the book of Galatians chapter 1, that when he was under the law, when he was studying that religion, Judaism, he talks about this idea where he was basically better than any of his contemporaries. He was smart. He was intelligent. And God, though that man, Paul was inspired, God grabbed that man and used his personality, used his intelligence to talk about the resurrection of the dead in 1 Corinthians 15. And he's laying out this great logic that he's communicating to his original audience and also communicating it to us. So Grab your Bibles again, 1 Corinthians 15, notice verse 12, notice the logic Paul is using here when he talks about this subject. Chapter 15, verse 12, he says, Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Here's the logic, verse 13. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith is also in vain. He's going to say the exact same thing. If you work your way down to verse 16, He's going to say, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Did you notice the logic that Paul is using here? We could say that point number one, what Paul's trying to get at is that Jesus's resurrection is in connection to our resurrection. His resurrection has an effect on our resurrection because if Christ had not been raised, then It's not going to make sense to say then we're going to be raised. No. In fact, Paul says it matters. It really does matter when it comes to our resurrection and determining did Christ rise from the dead? And Paul's answer, of course, is going to be yes. Because number one, you see everybody have this type of a faith. It's obedient faith. It's a faith that's in Jesus Christ. You see a group of people, this movement, if you will, having this faith, but yet if Christ didn't raise from the dead, then why would there be this great movement? Number two, everybody's preaching about it, but if it wasn't true, why is there preaching going on about somebody rising from the dead? That wouldn't make any sense. But then if you just go back to verse number three, verse number three of chapter 15, notice what it says. Verse three of chapter 15, he says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died according to the scriptures. He was also buried and that he was raised according to the scriptures. That phrase, according to the scriptures, is significant, Paul says. That's how We can prove Jesus rose from the dead. If Jesus rose from the dead, that means that we are going to rise from the dead too because that is also according to the scriptures. What Paul has in mind when he says Christ rose from the dead according to the scriptures, what he has in mind is he's referring to the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms. That is scripture. Those are the things which have been written down concerning his resurrection. Those things... 
the law, the prophets, the Psalms, they mention Christ rising from the dead. Paul mentioned those three categories, if you will, in Luke chapter 24, where he says, the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, everything that has been written about me in those things concerning me must be fulfilled. And it is fulfilled. So when Paul says that right here in chapter 15, you can take it to the bank, Corinth Christians, that Christ rose from the dead according to the biblical canon of scripture. And if that being the case, and it is the case, then you have nothing to worry about when it comes to the resurrection of the dead, your resurrection, you will be raised on the last day. Don't worry about it. Therefore, the preaching is good. It's not in vain. Your faith is good. It's not in vain. You are not in your sins anymore. You've been set free from that. That that could be point number one, what Paul's trying to get at in chapter 15. But here is what also Paul's trying to get at concerning the resurrection of the dead coming from 1 Corinthians 15. If you look at verse 35, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35, notice what he says. But someone will say, how were the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? Okay, so now we're talking about, okay, Paul, you say that we're going to rise from the dead because Christ rose from the dead. Okay, when we rise, are we having the same bodies? Do we have a different body? Well, notice what he says, verse 36 of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. He says, you fool, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. That and that, verse 37, and that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. In other words, when our body goes into the ground, it dies, and it has to die in order for it to come to life, for us to really come to life, just like how he has in his mind, Paul has in his mind, like a farmer sowing a seed, it's already corruptible, it's perishable. When it goes into the ground and then it grows and grows and it grows into whatever that seed is, it comes to life, actually. That's when it comes to life. And Paul's going to really get down to that. If you work your way down to the text in verse number 44, verse 44, it says, it is sown a natural body, that's our physical body, it is raised a spiritual body. But here's the point that I'm trying to get at, what Paul's trying to get at. Verse 44, if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. That's like point number two Paul's trying to get at in this chapter. That if we have a physical body, Paul says it is a matter of a fact that we have to have a spiritual body. That's the only way this makes sense. It does make sense. Again, if one's going to say that we have a spiritual body, well, we have to have a physical body. Of course we do. We see it all around us, right? And therefore, we have to have a spiritual body that is awaiting us. But then point number three is, when are we going to get that body, that spiritual body? Well, Paul's going to say in verse 50, verse 50 of chapter 15, he says, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, they cannot go to heaven. And that kind of a body, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Verse 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep and we all will be changed to that new body. Verse 52, here's when we, here, here's when, when it happens. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that is in a blink. You know how fast a blink is. It's pretty quick. In a twinkling of an eye and also at the last trumpet. What well, is that trumpet? You would, go over, you would go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, where it talks about the dead in Christ are going to rise first. They're going to get that new body, and the trumpet of God is going to be blasted. It's going to be sounded. That's when Jesus comes. That's what Paul has in mind here. So verse 52, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. So again, point number one is, Jesus' resurrection has an effect on our resurrection. His resurrection is connected with our resurrection. Number two is, if we have a physical body, we've got to have a spiritual body. Ain't no doubt about it. And when we get that spiritual body, we are going to be changed fairly quickly. It's not going to be the slow process. It's going to be pretty quick. And you know what's really cool about that thought is who is going to assist 
in that process. The process of giving us this new body. You go over to Philippians, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, and you start in verse 20, chapter 3, verse 20. Notice who is involved in the process of giving us our new body. Chapter 3, verse 20 of Philippians, he says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. Who will transform? Jesus is playing a role in this process. And how cool is that? He is involved in the process of changing our physical body into a spiritual body, and we are just going to be like him. It probably raises us several questions, doesn't it? What's it, what's it really going to look like? Will we have eyeballs? Will we have hands? You know, maybe those types of questions. And the truth is, God didn't really reveal detail by detail what this spiritual body is really going to look like. He just says that there is one for everybody, those who die in Christ or those who remain alive in Christ, who are faithful to him until he comes. In fact, if you go over to 1 John, 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, and it's in verse number 2. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, notice what John says. He says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. It's fascinating from this, from this standpoint. John, this writer of 1 John, is the same John as the writer of the gospel, the gospel of John. And he identifies himself as the disciple whom Jesus loves. Very close disciple of Jesus. Jesus really, really loved this disciple and yet still did not reveal what this spiritual body is going to look like. So John says, look, even we, we the apostles, we have no idea what's, what it's going to look like. And we were all close to him. He did not even reveal that to us. So that's what he's saying here. We continue the thought though. We know, he says, we know for a fact that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Again, we don't really know what that looks like, but we're going to be the same. Jesus is going to play a role into that, giving us our new spiritual body. And when he does, check this out, this is pretty cool. When he does, he is going to marvel at the sight of our new bodies. And here's where I'm getting at. You go over to 2 Thessalonians, <clears throat> excuse me, 2 Thessalonians, and you go over to chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and look at verse 10. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, when Jesus gives us our new bodies, when he returns for us, look what he does here. Chapter 1, verse 10 of 2 Thessalonians, he says, When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who had believed, for our testimony to you was believed. The context is when he comes, retribution, affliction, eternal penalty, condemnation is going to be given to those who do not know God and do not obey God. The gospel, but his relief is going to be given to those who do know God and to those who obey God. So it says when he comes, he's going to be marveled at the sight of what we now look like. We are just like him and we will see him. And there's other passages that come to my mind. The thought of, okay, when that day comes, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord and every knee is going to bow before him. So maybe there's a little hint within itself there saying that. Okay, whatever the body, that spiritual body is going to look like, it's going to have the ability to confess Jesus is Lord. It's going to have the ability to bow down to him, knowing that he's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. And going back over to 1 Corinthians 15, and also having the eyes to see him just as he is, but going back over to 1 Corinthians 15, it has to be some kind of body, the spiritual body, it has to be some kind of body where we see something that is going to be very, very 
cool. And here's what I'm talking about. 1 Corinthians 15, and you look at verse 24, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, verse 24, Paul says, then comes the end. When he, that's Jesus, when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power, for he, that's Jesus, must remain until he, Jesus, has put all his enemies, or rather, until he, that's God, until he has put all his enemies under his feet, under the feet of Jesus. And here's the enemy that has left to be conquered. The last enemy, verse 26, that will be abolished is death, physical death. That hasn't been abolished yet, right? Because everybody is still passing away from this life. Verse 27, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who puts all things in subjection to him. It's expected. Verse 28, when all things are subjected to him, then the son himself also will be subjected to the one, that's the father, to the one who subjected all things to him so that God, so that God may be all in all. That's what I'm talking about. It has to be a body where we have the ability to see God all in all. We have to be able to see that. Seeing Jesus hand the kingdom and everything back over to the Father and seeing Jesus, Jesus himself, in submission to the Father. That's going to be a great event. That's going to be a cool event. So again, we're not really raving about a word or a phrase. We're just raving about a message, a very cool, interesting message, a message about the resurrection of the dead. The message is... There is this connection between Jesus' resurrection and our resurrection. It's a message that says if we have a physical body, then we have got to have a spiritual body that's waiting for us. It's a message that says, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a message that says we will be changed fairly quickly. And Jesus is going to help in that process. He's going to glorify, be marveled at the new side of what we look like. And then he'll take us back to glory and we get to see all these events laid out and be with him forever and ever and ever. Maybe another question is this, too, as we quickly wrap up here, we could probably spend a lot of time even on this subject, on this question. Will we be able to recognize each other in heaven? Will we be able to recognize, you know, the real Jesus, the real God, the real Moses, the real Abraham? And in a very short answer, I think the answer is yes, because from the examples of the rich man and Lazarus, in other words, how did Lazarus know that was Abraham who he was talking to? There's not really any pictures, no no drawings of the real Abraham in those times. Another great example was this, the Mount of Transfiguration. When Jesus took Peter, James, and John, just them, and there's that image that's displayed in front of those three. Moses represents the law of Moses. And then Elijah represents the prophets, and Peter's able to identify who Moses is and who Elijah is. The question is, how did Peter know that over there is Moses and over there it's Elijah? How did he know not to confuse the two? Again, there's no pictures. There's no drawings. So how did Peter, how in the world could Peter know that? Therefore, we have to be able to recognize each other in the afterlife from just even those examples. And that's going to be pretty cool. It's going to be pretty cool, pretty awesome to think about. We'll be able to recognize our loved ones. We'll be able to recognize who we are when we are in heaven, especially Jesus himself. I pray this is encouraging to you. Pray this is uplifting to you. Just raving about a simple message, the resurrection of the dead. I've been your host, Remy, or better known as Remington Afri, the youth minister at the Meadows Church of Christ, right here in Beaumont in the great state of Texas. Please come see us. We're at 9195 Dishman Road, 9195 Dishman Road. Please come worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9.30 a.m., Bible cast at 11 a.m., and also Sunday evenings at 5 p.m. We meet in the middle of the week at 6.30 p.m. We love to see you, to love on you, care for you, and hug on you. Again, I've been your host, Remy. This has been episode number 55, raving about a special message, the youth minister at the Meadows Church of Christ right here in Beaumont in the great state of Texas. Lord willing, we'll do this tomorrow at 3 p.m. Tune in if you can, and we'll see you next time. Continue. Have a great rest of your Tuesday and a great rest of your week. Godspeed.